Thank you. So yeah, my name is Sasha, and other than what was just told about me, I'm also in charge of a thing called the Secret Society of the Stropafel. Hence, I brought these. If this means nothing to you, find me later. I don't talk about it on video, because that would ruin the secrecy. Um, and I also run a project called Happiness Packets, where we try to make open source communities happier places. I have some really cool swag, so find me later for that also. And so um, I've always been very interested in cryptography uh, and, and how it works. But when I would try to learn anything about it, I would encounter things like these. I am not great at mathematics and understanding mathematical notations and things. So I would very quickly lose track of things. It would just mean very little to me. And uh, I happened to find found some resources, which I'll share with you later also, that helped me understand the fundamentals better. And once you understand some of the basic concepts and how they fit together, it also becomes much easier to learn anything new and to fit it into the things you already know. Um, so let's do a little demo. This is an encrypted text on a single line. So this is actually the best way I've ever been insulted on the internet, encrypted. Can someone mention something that they notice about this text, some patterns that you see? There's two recurring apostrophes there. Also, some of these, these sort of words, they end in the same letters. And so this is encrypted with a very poor cryptographic cipher. Nobody actually uses this. Um, it is a single byte XOR cipher. And uh, that means that you take every byte from the text, uh, and then you XOR it with a key, which is a single byte. I could do this for every single byte, basically. Um, and when you do this, and you do it with the right key, out you get the best way I've ever been insulted on the internet. Uh, and so single byte XOR basically works. You take a character, uh, you take the, the, the ASCII value of the character, you XOR it with a key, out comes the decrypted character. You can do this the other way around also. Uh, XORs you'll find at the root of lots of cryptographic algorithms, but not as bad as this. Uh, also, an interesting feature is if you take the uh, ciphertext we have up there and XOR it with the clear text, it'll just tell you the key, which is a very bad property. So what are properties of actually good ciphers? For one, the security has to depend only uh, on the chosen key. So if you have to uh, keep secret what algorithm you use or its parameters, that means your crypto is probably broken. The outcome of the algorithm, so the ciphertext, the encrypted text, should be close to random and shouldn't give any hint of structure. So in the example I gave before, you could see that there were clear words, that they had similar patterns in the words. That is a very bad thing. It shouldn't tell you anything about what the structure was of the original. Um, you also want the ciphertext to change dramatically when uh, the clear text changes slightly so that if someone is able to capture two ciphertext, two bits of encrypted data, they don't know how similar the originals were uh, because that's a way that information can leak. If you get a clear text with a matching ciphertext, it shouldn't tell you anything about the key because if you could, then you would only have to do it once and then you'd be able to decrypt other messages, which you're not supposed to do. And there should be basically no faster method than a full brute force attacks trying every single key, which in modern algorithms is just impossible. Uh, there are too many. Uh, some algorithms have some slight weaknesses that reduce the security by a few bits. So there's a little bit of room in there, uh, but not a lot. This is also slightly simplified. I know the talk is everything I always wanted to know about crypto, but it's more everything that fits into 40 minutes. So. Here and there, we have to skip a few things. Uh, so let's talk about one of the most common cybers used today, uh, Advanced Encryption Standard, uh, standardized in 2001. And it is a block cipher, which means it takes 16 bytes precisely of clear text. Then it encrypts them and produces 16 bytes precisely of ciphertext using a key that can be 128, 192, or 256 bits. And uh, if you look at how AES works, there's actually a little bit of the original cipher I showed you before. Uh, so AES basically takes these 16 bytes, and it puts them in a matrix. And there's basically only four steps that it does. 
Uh, first, it takes each single byte that you put in, in the clear text, and substitutes it with something else. According to a substitution box, this provides nonlinearity, so it creates a disconnect between the clear text and the ciphertext. Then it takes the matrix of those 16 bytes that you put in, which have now been substituted, shifts all the rows to the left by a certain amount, which uh, destroys coherence between the columns in the data. Then it takes each new column and substitutes the whole column with a whole set of new values. Um, and then in the last step, it takes the now mangled uh, clear text, XORs it with a key byte, and produces part of the ciphertext. It does this multiple times, so it does this 12 to 14 rounds. And basically, the key you see here is derived from the key you gave to the AES algorithm. But in essence, it still looks slightly like the poor algorithm I showed you before, except there are a lot of steps to basically destroy the coherence between these clear texts, between these ciphertexts, to prevent uh, someone from retrieving the key from a captured clear text and ciphertext. Also, don't implement AES based on my slides, because I skipped a few steps. Um, and so there's a, so block ciphers work. A block cipher like AES works very well. It is very reliable. There are some hard to use vulnerabilities that decrease security by one or two bits. But other than that, it is very solid. It is very simple to use. Um, except the downside is it only does 16 bytes, and precisely 16 bytes. And very often, we'd want to encrypt more data. So how do you do that? Um, one thing you could do is you take your first 16 bytes of clear text. You encrypt it with AES given a key. You get 16 bytes of ciphertext. Then you take the next 16 bytes, encrypt that with the same key. And you have another 16 bytes of ciphertext. And you keep going until your data is all encrypted. Uh, this is called electronic codebook. And it is a terrible idea. Because this is the original image on the left. On the right, the same image encrypted with uh, AES in uh, electronic codebook mode. And so what you see is that some of the coherence in the data is still present. Like, you definitely lost some information, but a lot of information is still present. So this definitely means this is a very poor way to encrypt data, because you're leaking a lot of structure. And the reason for that is that uh, basically all the white blocks, uh, whenever you take a block of white in your image data and then encrypt it, and then you have another block which looks the same as you encrypt it, you produce exactly the same output. So basically, someone can tell whether block number four and block number five had the same data. Uh, so it makes it a terrible idea, because you're leaking information through. Um, so one very common alternative is to use cipher block chaining, where you basically start off with the same thing, except before you encrypt, you XOR all the bytes with an initialization vector. These are basically 16 bytes. They are random, but not secret. And every time you do this, you take a new random value. I'll show you later when you, what happens when you don't. And for the second block, you take the outcome of the encryption of the first block, XOR that with the clear text of the second block, and basically you continue like that. And what this means is that if those two clear texts are identical, the ciphertexts are not. And if they were not identical, the ciphertexts are also not the same. So basically, you don't leak structure on which blocks were the same. Uh, a variant of this is counter mode. Um, and in counter mode, you actually don't encrypt your data. You encrypt a nonce, which is sort of like an IV. It is random. It is not secret, plus a counter, which just counts up for every block. And the outcome of that, you extra with your plain text, and that becomes your ciphertext. Uh, and this is secure because the outcome of encrypting the nonce plus counter with the key is unknown to someone else. So they can't retrieve the plain text unless they have the key. And also here, different, the same blocks of clear text will result in different blocks of ciphertext. Uh, if you reuse your initialization vectors, this is actually not an uncommon vulnerability. Um, you'll get the thing where if you encrypt two things that only have a difference later on in the file, uh, and you use CBC with the same IV, 
then those two outcomes will be identical until their first difference, because the first block, if you put the same data in, you use the same IV, the same key, the outcome will be the same. If you use a random initialization vector every time, the outcome for doing this twice is different. There's even worse in counter mode. So IVs have to be random, uh, just so that you don't get this type of you're not able to retrieve whether two blocks of encrypted data were identical in any way. Because basically, all of these kind of things, when you can, this may not be an issue in an application, but it's a thing you want to avoid because any leaking of information about structure, about similarity, can introduce vulnerabilities uh, somewhere else. Uh, so AES has, as a very simple block cipher, has also an interesting property. This is a Python example. It works the same in every language. If you take a clear text, a random key, uh, you uh, encrypt it, then the cipher text is basically unreadable semi-random data. If you then decrypt with the right key, you get your data out. However, uh, something interesting happens when you use the wrong key, which is that there are no errors or anything. You just get different data, because AES is simply a set of mathematical operations, so there's no right and wrong key. It's just if you enter the same key, like you did when you encrypted it, the same, the mathematics will result in the same answer. Uh, but if you use a different key, it'll just do those calculations and give you a different answer. Um, and so uh, this can be used in certain cases. Uh, you can do very interesting attacks with this. For example, if you use CBC decryption, so this is basically upside down from the last image. You start with a cipher text, uh, CBC, uh, AES decrypt it, and then XOR it with the previous block. Uh, so this is somewhere in the middle of the CBC stream. So if I am able to manipulate ciphertext, let's say I intercept them from a network, and then I modify them and send them along, I can't read what they say because I don't have the key. However, I could send one on and manipulate, say, one of the bits in that first block, which will basically result in this block when the proper recipient decrypts it. It'll just be garbage data. However, because of the uh, XOR on the second block, basically this change will be reflected in this block, in the clear text, in a predictable way. Uh, so basically, you will destroy one block. But in the other block, you produce a predictable variation. Uh, and in some cases, this is exploitable. Not in all cases, uh, but it can happen. And you can basically do this in any block you want. Um, and in a more complicated variation, this can result in a uh, padding oracle attack where you're able to actually retrieve information based on responses from the other end. And this is actually something that still happens in real-world attacks on, say, uh, on TLS, where if you weaken the authentication somehow, then you can sometimes exploit this bug. To prevent that, you need, in addition to encryption, uh, authentication to know is the message that I am receiving from an authentic source, and has it not been meddled with, which is something that AES will not protect you against, because it's an encryption algorithm. Um, and so cryptographic hashing, uh, I've taken SHA-2 as an example here. Uh, basically, you can take data of any length, and it'll produce a hash of a fixed length. And if you change the data slightly, or make it shorter or longer, then it'll produce a radically different hash. Uh, and so some properties of good cryptographic hashes are that they are fast and that they don't require a lot of resources. A related exception is key derivation or password storage. So if you want to store passwords, you actually don't want it to be fast. You want it to require a lot of resources. So that's why methods like bcrypt or pbkdf2 for modern password storage are used. So they're sort of the opposite. It should be basically impossible to calculate the original input based on the hash you had. Usually, also, the original input was larger, so this is physically impossible. Uh, if you change the input slightly, it has to lead to large changes in hash outputs, so that based on two hashes, you don't know how similar the original was. Of course, the same input always has to lead to the same hash, otherwise you can't do comparisons. Uh, and it should be unfeasible to find two messages with the same hash, which we call collisions. So collisions are guaranteed to happen, because the hash has a fixed size. So if you encrypt and if you hash enough messages, eventually there will be a collision. But the point is that you can't 
make one on purpose, or at least it would require so many resources that this isn't realistically possible. Um, sometimes people use hashing by taking, like, they'll take AES-CBC on their clear text, produce their ciphertext, produce a hash of their ciphertext, and put it in their message. Uh, this kind of uh, hashing is useless because uh, it doesn't actually prove that the person who put the hash there had the key, so it doesn't authenticate. Um, so you can use this against unintentional data corruption, but this doesn't help for intentional corruption, in which case you would use a hash message authentication code. So it's basically a way to use a cryptographic hash like SHA-2. SHA-2 is generally a good choice. And also use a key in there, which basically means that someone who doesn't have the key and tries to alter the message um, is not able to generate a new valid hash for that message. So if someone alters the message while it's in transit, the hash validation will fail, and you'll know the message has been tampered with. Uh, also in here, you see, by the way, that the initialization vector, I briefly showed it before, you need it for decryption. So you send it along with the ciphertext, because it is not secret. It just has to be random and different every time. Uh, another interesting approach for this is uh, GCM mode. GCM mode is basically counter mode with authentication built in. So in like the top part here, you can still see there's a counter. It increments, uh, and then it encrypts XORs with the plain text, like I showed you before, and produce a block of ciphertext. But then there are additional steps in it that produce an authentication tag. And basically, on decryption, you provide the, uh, the mode with the authentication tag. And then it'll also tell you whether the message has been tampered with. The nice thing about this is that it is fewer steps to implement, so it is harder to accidentally screw something up. So AES is a very common symmetric cipher. It's like it's being used by all your phones right now. Um, and symmetric ciphers are nice because they are very simple, they are very fast, they are fairly easy to understand and implement. Uh, but the downside is that you need to have the same key for encryption and decryption, which if like, you're trying to talk to a web server, this doesn't really scale because you would need a secure channel to first decide on a key with that web server. Uh, and that's not really practical. Uh, so for that, we have asymmetric ciphers where you use a different key for encryption and decryption. So somebody can give me a key, I can encrypt something for them, and only they can decrypt it. Um, and so asymmetric ciphers are more complicated in implementation, but their fundament is usually that they work through some kind of trapdoor function, so mathematical functions that are very easy to do one way, but virtually impossible to do the other way unless you have additional data. Um, so for example, in the case of RSA, one of the most commonly used asymmetric algorithms, uh, it is uh, prime vectorization. So if you multiply very large prime numbers, it is very, very difficult and near impossible to separate them into the original primes, unless there is some additional information you have. Um, so with RSA, you basically you take a clear text, you do a RSA encryption. Um, you do that using someone's public key that you're trying to send the data to. You send them the data, um, and they can decrypt it with their own private key. Um, RSA is a lot slower than AES also. The keys are a lot bigger because of the different uh, concepts involved. Um, and so the downside of it being slow is that generally for things like web servers, you don't actually want to do this process for all the data because it's just too slow. It's not very optimized. So something that you can do, say, is that this clear text that you're exchanging is actually a symmetric key that you then use as your AES encryption key. And so this way, you can securely send your key to someone else that has the private key. Um, and then the thing, then, you have a, a, then you've both agreed on the same key without, while transmitting it securely. Uh, and then you can do AES, for example, which makes it much faster. Uh, TLS can do this, uh, but it's slightly more complicated than this. But generally, vaguely, this is, uh, is a concept that's widely used in SSL and TLS. 
And basically what we would call this is a shared secret. You develop a shared secret that only you know and nobody else knows. One of the downsides of this is that uh, when you send all this data over the internet, and at any point in time later, this private key is compromised, that means you can decrypt all historical data that was ever sent if you captured it at the time. Because using the private key, you can decrypt the transmission of the shared secret, which you can then use to decrypt the entire data stream. This is one of the reasons why this is not a very popular scheme anymore. Um, because basically, it lacks what we call forward secrecy, that if your key is captured in the future, the data from the past ideally should be protected. Uh, one alternative to this is uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, it's also one of the things known for is SSH. And basically, you both have a public key. You both have the other person's public key. You have your own private key. Uh, then the algorithm uh, will basically uh, send, do some of the work, then exchange the work with the other side, then do some more work, and then you will both end up with the same shared secret, but the data that was sent over the internet does not have sufficient data information to obtain the shared secret. So you'll both end up with a secret, but there's no way for anyone else to have obtained that, even if they listen to all your data. Uh, a distinction that's made in, uh, say, TLS is that Diffie-Hellman reuses some of the parameters that were used in the algorithm uh, when it's called DH. Uh, the downside of this is it's, the upside is faster. Uh, the downside is it doesn't uh, provide forward secrecy either. You can do ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, um, and then you do get forward secrecy. The downside is it is slower. This is actually really quite slow, which is why it's not been so popular historically. Uh, lots of revelations about governments intercepting information have made it a bit more popular because then people realized how much data was actually being stored. Uh, and so an interesting, slightly newer option is elliptic curve cryptography. So you could, for example, have elliptic curve ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. And um, this is basically based on a different kind of trapdoor function, so this, this kind of method that makes it very easy to encrypt something for someone, but virtually impossible to decrypt without the private key. Um, I don't actually fully understand how it works, because the mathematics are just too deep for me. Um, but it is a much faster option uh, based on different, different mathematical problems. Uh, another issue is trust. So let's say we have two people. They exchange a message. Uh, Alice sends her public key to Claire. Claire uses that to encrypt a message, sends the message back, and uh, Alice can decrypt it. We're presuming she has the private key. Um, the catch here is that if there was a person in the middle, they could easily take that public key and instead send their own key pair to the person who's trying to send a message. Uh, they will RSA encrypt it for the wrong person. Uh, the person in the middle can then decrypt the message and re-encrypt it and like, do whatever they want with it, really, and, and change it in any way. And then it will decrypt as a valid message. So, uh, and none of these parties on either side know that this is happening. So this can happen silently unless they have a method of figuring out, is this the genuine key that I should expect from, uh, from the other side? So the most common thing we use now uh, is using RSA signatures. So for example, for my web server, there is a public key. Um, I then get a certificate authority to sign that public key. That gets put together into a certificate. And, uh, Usually, you do this through a number of layers so that you get a certificate chain. And uh, so basically, all of our browsers, they have almost identical, not always identical, lists of root certificates that they trust. They usually sign a, uh, another certificate. That certificate is then used to sign something for me. And so there is a chain of trust because uh, the people that run this certificate authority have promised that they will, only, uh, they will only sign 
a key, they will only sign a certificate for my website after they've checked that it's really mine. So they promise that. Google says, that's cool. We'll put you in Chrome. Um, this doesn't always work. So there are some, this sometimes goes bad. People sometimes have their root certificates compromised. Uh, sometimes they abuse them. Uh, so that's a bit of a tricky area. Also, there are a lot of politics involved in these kind of things. But a lot of the time, it works well. They have some kind of verification mechanism to check that they really believe that is my domain name. And if that verification fails, they won't sign the certificate. So this is basically how we do trust in, uh, in say, HTTPS. You can also actually make your own certificate authority. Some people who make apps do this. So because the client is under your control, some people who make mobile apps, they sometimes make their own certificate authority and trust only that, which reduces the uh, scope of attacks. Another option that's sometimes used is uh, Web of Trust. PGP does this, um, but PGP is not really usable. I, don't, I barely even use it myself because it's so horrible. Um, Web of Trust have other problems, basically. They're nice, they're more decentralized, but they're much harder to scale. Um, so one of the most common applications that we all use encryption in is uh, SSL, or as it's nowadays technically called TLS. Uh, it has a long history of also very bad practices, but nowadays it's quite strong. As well, version 1 was never published. Version 2 was absolutely horrible. Some people still run this in production. Uh, SL version 3 basically redesigned uh, the entire protocol. It is now obsolete. Uh, interesting features that have been added are uh, authenticated encryption in TLS 1.2. So the uh, GCM mode that I showed you before was added in 2008. TLS 1.2 also added extensions so that you could basically bolt on uh, new things to the protocol if both sides supported it. Uh, newest one in 2018 is 1.3, which requires forward secrecy. So uh, the things I showed you before about like the naive key exchange, naively exchanging an uh, AES key by just RSA encrypting it, the other side RSA decrypting it, you can't do that anymore in TLS 1.3. Uh, you also have to do authenticated encryption, and there's a bunch of other security hardening steps. Um, and so in TLS, you'll usually see scary-looking cipher suites, which are basically like all of the, the, the uh, algorithms I talked about combined. So uh, TLS, RSA, with AES128, CBC, SHA basically means it does RSA key exchange. So basically, the shit, a slightly more complicated version of the, the thing I showed you where you just transmit a key. If the other person can decrypt it, now you have a shared secret to do AES128 in this case. RSA for authentication, so for checking, do, should I trust this certificate? Uh, and SHAM on Max, this is not actually a great choice, uh, and also not allowed in TLS 1.3. Uh, more modern cybers are uh, TLS ECDHC, RSA with AES128, GCM SHA256. They are very long nuclear names. Uh, so you can have TLS with elliptic curve, ephemeral diffie hellman key exchange, which means it is fast, and you get forward secrecy. RSA authentication, uh, which is basically pretty universal. AES128 and GCM. Um, so these are, base, these are basically good choices. You don't have to remember them all, because I'll show you later how you can make good choices with this yourself. Uh, some servers will still support very old modes like TLS, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which means no forward secrecy, and it is slow. Uh, no authentication. This is actually a valid option in uh, especially older versions of TLS and SSL, you can choose not to have any authentication of whether you're talking to the right person, uh, RC4 encryption, MD5. These are all terrible choices. Uh, you'll also notice that it mentions export, because these cipher suites were made when uh, encryption standards were very heavily regulated, and so you could only export very weak ones. Uh, so anything in cryptography that says export should raise alarm bells, because it's probably intentionally weakened. Um, you sometimes still encounter things like this in the real world. I would hope most modern web servers don't allow you to enable these kind of things anymore. So what choices should you make? So when it comes to TLS configuration, uh, there is a company 
uh, that makes a SSL test. So it's SSLlabs.com. They make an SSL test. And this is basically the tool to use. Uh, it is an extremely thorough test, so it goes through all your cyber suites and which one you have enabled. Uh, it checks things like, do you still have SSL version 2? Uh, it checks for all kinds of vulnerabilities like Heartbleed or Poodle or Lucky13 and all the other very interesting sounding names that have been made for TLS vulnerabilities. Uh, it also does, uh, we'll find out what browsers are going to negotiate which cyber suites with, on which platforms. So for example, it might tell you which uh, platforms you're now incompatible with, uh, but also which platforms will, you will have forward secrecy with, because not every platform supports the same set. And depending on the sets that you offer, you'll negotiate certain things uh, with people on certain platforms. If you're going to do symmetric cryptography in your own code, it's a little bit less straightforward. A very good choice is Fernet. Um, I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, there are a bunch of implementations in different languages. And the nice thing is it, uh, it's basically a library that does everything for you, and they do it really well. Uh, so there is very little opportunity for you to forget something and screw something up. Uh, this is AES128CBC, which is a decent choice. There's a hash mesh authentication code based on SHA-2. Uh, you can even do things like uh, rolling keys. So you can say, I want to have multiple keys valid for a little while. And so it deals with a lot of things where so you don't have to. If you're going to build your own thing, my first inclination, with some caveats, would be AS256 GCM with a key derivation function, which I haven't mentioned before, uh, of one of those. Key derivation functions are basically needed if you take, say, a password that a human came up with and want to use it as a cryptographic key, because humans are very bad at creating random data. And so a key derivation function basically uh, makes the brute forcing process a lot harder, because uh, basically to take the, the small set of passwords humans can come up with and calculate those into the actual encryption keys that may have been used is in these functions intentionally so. So putting a password in and getting a cryptographic key out is very slow and hard to optimize, which doesn't matter if you only do it once, but it matters a lot when you're trying to brute force. Uh, these are also all used a lot for password storage, because that's where the same features are desirable. Um, I say this with a caveat, because there are a lot of individual considerations that can apply. Uh, so this is a broad recommendation, and your situation may be different. If you're going to do asymmetric crypto, it kind of depends. I once tried to integrate with GNU PG. It's horrible. Um, GNU PG is also, by the way, RSA usually, RSA uh, signing and encryption. Uh, it's very hard to give a specific recommendation because it really depends on your specific problem. Like, not a lot of us need asymmetric cryptography in our own code. Um, usually, you just use HTTPS, and that's your only application of it. So if you're going to do this yourself, then the answer is not straightforward. Um, and also, there's a lot of more environmental factors to consider, uh, which is generally an issue in cryptography, because one of the common errors people make is failing to consider a wide range of threats. So uh, a weakness in your cryptographic cipher that you've chosen is not actually a very common attack. Uh, it's people who just don't think about, has someone written the password on a post-it? I mean, it's not technically a cryptographic vulnerability, but it will still uh, cause things to be compromised. So they're like failing to consider the, the things that happen outside uh, of your own code. Failing to authenticate is very common. Not having an authentication code, not checking it, not checking the certificate chain is still a pretty common thing. Uh, confusing authentication and confidentiality is basically related. So the fact that something is now secret does not mean that the message is authentic. So the fact that you received something and it was encrypted doesn't guarantee that it wasn't tampered with. That requires an authentication, like a message authentication code. Uh, improper key handling is very common. Uh, AES does nothing for you if you leak your key. So if you don't use a key derivation function, so basically passwords that humans came up with, which may not have any checking, whether they're just password or one, two, three. 
Uh, in that case, cryptographic algorithms do very little for you. Uh, I should also mention for the first one, recovery is also something people often forget. So what if things break? What if you lose some bit of data? What if this server breaks down? Because if you lose the key through any kind of accident, all the data is basically gone. You will never, ever get it back. And that's also something that people sometimes forget. And then, well, they have all their data. They just can never decrypt it. Uh, lastly, there are side channel vulnerabilities, uh, which can basically, which basically mean that some other data is leaking out, which allows someone to derive information about what you're doing. Uh, so one typical one is compression. Uh, we've had a few vulnerabilities in TLS around that. Uh, so for example, uh, one of them was if you enable GZIP on your responses from your web server, then the response, even encrypted, will be smaller if more of the content is similar to each other, because this is what compression algorithms do. If you have a bunch of parts of your data that are very similar, it will compress better. And so from the size of the data that came out, if you could manipulate some of the input, you could sometimes derive uh, secrets that were in there. So you could, uh, uh, you could basically defeat uh, features like cross-site request forging, which depend on a secret token in a page because of compression, because compression gave you information. The size of the data after compression gave you information about the coherence in it. So this is why GZIP isn't very popular anymore. Uh, sometimes errors that are provided can give this kind of data, too. Um, so one of the best resources I know for this, this is basically how I learned everything I know, well, a lot of what I know, are a set of crypto challenges made by a security company called Matasano. And these are really good challenges. You can do them in any language. And uh, these are very well written to help you, basically. They challenge you, but they give you just enough information to learn something new. So they're not all simple. I never actually finished the whole set. I only got halfway. Uh, and so they also escalate. So you start with building something very simple. I think my single byte extra is in there. And then you figure out how to break it. And at some point, you start doing more complicated things. And uh, then they help you to learn yourself how you break these kind of things. I've actually found real-world crypto vulnerabilities based on things I learned in the first few set of this challenge. And my second recommendation is uh, this book, Bulletproof SSL and TLS, written by the same author as the SSL test I showed earlier. This is a very accessible book, but also very thorough. So there's uh, basically how SSL and TLS work and how you should configure it but also extensive discussion of basically all the history, uh, all the interesting vulnerabilities we had, and how they happened, and how sometimes really small mistakes, if you have the right circumstances, can cause uh, very serious vulnerabilities, and what we've done now to harden against those. So uh, I strongly recommend these books. And if you find these kind of things interesting, you should really try to start the challenges. Uh, they are challenging, but it's great fun to, to learn so much new stuff. Uh, and it's basically how I learned everything that's in this slide deck. Thank you very much.